How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm pretty fantabulous. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. You know what today is? You know what this is? It is our very last full-sized episode for the year 2020. May it 2020. rest in hell. Yeah, thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Next. Yeah, let's hope 2021 is so much better. It's got to be right. I keep See, I can't even say that because every single time I said that this year, something would happen. And oh, yeah. I'd be like, you've got to be kidding. Well, so, I don't have a lot of confidence. In fact, I'm not even going to buy a planner for 2021. How about how does that sound? I did. I bought one yesterday. Did you? I did. I'm not going to jinx it that way. And it's an 18 month one. So I was like, okay, come at me. Come at me. 2021 <laughs> and 2022. Don't tempt it. Don't. That's what I said. I know. I know. Sunday, our very first episode from the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas lands. Yep. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, make sure you check it out. You guys will get all the Our True Crime podcast your heart could ever want, and then some. Starting on December 13th all the way through December 24th, you will get one brand new episode from us each day. Each day. Woohoo! That's OTCP overload if there is such a thing. We do the 12 nightmares before Christmas. Day one, you get one body. All the way up to day 12, there will be... 12 bodies. It's morbid, but what else would you want to wrap your Christmas presents to? Whatever. <laughs> Listen, while you're listening to murder and wrap yes. your presents. Whatever. I'm a little out of it today. I'm a little discombobulated. Good old American tradition of wrapping presents and listening to murder exactly. podcast. This Let's is our third year doing it, too. Can you believe it? It's been no, three cannot. years. Cannot. Pretty soon we're going to run out of people. No, unfortunately we won't. We might have problems making the numbers match up, but we'll wing it. Oh, we'll yeah. Yeah. Fudge it a little bit. But we'll give it our all. That's for sure. Well, at least 80%. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. We'll try 87%. All right. But what do you have right. for us today, the last episode of 2020? Well, I got to tell you, Jen, it's a humdinger. It really is a humdinger. So I guess we'll just dive right in, right? All righty. I like humdingers. <laughs> So, Jen, you and I can imagine this because we both have two kids. So go with me on that. So you're young. You have two little kids, two little children you're trying to raise. You know, you're trying to do the best you can since you recently went through a divorce. Mm -hmm. Your good friend asks you to go to a bar and, you know, you need to get out. You need to meet people. Okay. You decide to go. A handsome fella approaches you one night and you start to think, hmm, maybe things are looking up. He's handsome, well-dressed, and polite, but most of all, he showers you with all the attention you could ever need. You find yourself falling in love with this amazing guy, and maybe, just perhaps, it is with deep love for him that you can't see what is right in front of your eyes, because standing right there in front of you is someone you would truly never know or want to know. So with love blossoming, Nathaniel White moves in with his girlfriend named Jill. Jill was the one that he met at the bar. Now, times are tough as Nathaniel is out of work, but the couple is sure that he'll find work soon. You know, he's talented, he's got some skills, and he's also very charming. Now, the stresses of being short on cash are starting to pile up and, you know, the paying the bills, that's not going to wait. But, you know, things are about to get just a little bit weird. Were you going to say something? Were you going to say you're very talented, Billy? <laughs> I was going to say that. I know. You're very I talented, Billy. Very I was also going to say, you know, in a new relationship, it's hard enough, but throw in financial stress. Woo-wee. Right? Not cool. Yeah. 
here's where we get started. So one morning, couples, you know, it's early in the morning and Jill's getting ready for work. She's getting ready to start her day and somebody knocks at the front door. Now it's pretty early. So both of them are like, well, what the heck is that? What could that be? Well, the door opens and two policemen are standing there. The police asked to see Nathaniel. Now Jill's like, you, I, what's going on? You know what? I don't understand. Well, Nathaniel comes to the door and the police officers ask him if he has some time, <laughs> it's just what you want to hear, right, to come down to the station to answer a few questions. So perplexed, they both are demanding to know what in the world this is all about. And the officers tell them that there was a report of a man fitting the description of Nathaniel who had robbed a nearby convenience store. Well, upset, of course, and demanding that the officers have to have the wrong guy, Jill is She's beside herself, right? So Nathaniel oh so quietly admits that, in fact, he did rob the store because they needed the money. He was only trying to make things better for him, Jen. Nathaniel White's taken away by police, and after going to court, and this being his first offense, Nathaniel would only serve a few months in jail. Ever the supportive and loving girlfriend, Jill stands by his side, and she's going to be there to support him when he gets out, and the two of them can begin where they left off. Okay, would you die? Seriously, I'd be like, you did what? I, yeah. <laughs> no. There's limits to my tolerance. You know, I don't know if I could. <laughs> Robbing a convenience store. It, 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 that's just not on the things that I want my yeah, man of my dreams to do. You know, does yeah. that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I totally. I mean, I appreciate so when, the effort, but no. No is exactly right. So when he's released from jail, Jill had him lined up with the job. You know, uh, they were both excited. She had managed to, you know, talk to some people and get him a job ready for him. <laughs> Can imagine how jail. that conversation went. The couple, they were convinced they were on to bigger and better things. They were going to, you know, put all this behind them and just move on. You know, Jill started to notice a few subtle changes in Nathaniel. And one of these changes, and, you know, these aren't huge, but it's just different. Well, prison does that, that to a man, Camille. I guess so. He's only in there a couple months, and this is jail, not really prison, but okay. So one of these changes, and you know, it's not huge, but when they're not doing this, it is a little weird. Nathaniel started picking out clothes for Jill, you know, kind of telling her what to wear, mm-hmm. buying her clothes, which Red was flag. nice. Red flag. But mm-hmm. exactly. The clothes weren't really her style, but you know, she she wanted this relationship to work. And so, you know, okay, I'll wear that. But you know, that's not the only thing that was a little bit odd, if you will. So one evening, Jill's niece, Christine, who was just slightly older than Jill's two daughters, came over to play, hang out. You know, they'd always kind of play. She was um, 14 at the time. And so sort of a little built-in babysitter, but also a little playmate, right? Young enough to kind of enjoy playing with the littler girls, but also old enough to kind of, you know, give you a break. So Nathaniel was playing hide-and-seek with the girls and some other games, and they're, they're all having a great time, the four of them. Now, Christine had left the house just a few hours ago when the phone rang and it was Jill's brother, Christine's dad. And he called to tell Jill that Christine had told her dad something very alarming. And he had said that Christine told him that when they were playing, Nathaniel touched her inappropriately. Mm. Well, while he's still on the phone, of course, Jill is just like, Are, what? So she asked Nathaniel and Nathaniel denies it, claiming, you know, we we're just playing. We we're playing a little rough a little wrestling, a little hide and seek, things like that. You know, maybe I hit her somewhere or touched her somewhere, but it was, you know, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't, she is young and she must just didn't understand that it was an accident or whatever. So Jill even looked to her two daughters to kind of question them. And they both agreed. Yeah, we're just roughhousing, just having a good time. He was with us the whole time. He never touched her in an inappropriate manner. So Christine's dad says, okay, but guess what? Christine will not be coming over to your house for a while. Thank you. Which. I can't agree more with you. That there, buddy. excuse me out. No, there wouldn't. Mm-mm, that wouldn't fly with me. I can understand the excuse. I mean, it almost could be plausible, but no. So it's just a few months later, Jen, when Christine left her home to go to her friend's house and she never came back home. The 14 year old had always been a very respectful child and they were adamant that she'd never run away. She'd never go anywhere without telling her parents. She didn't even fight with her parents. She was a pretty good kid. So the neighbors and police, it's a smaller little area, pull together and they get a little search party going together, starting at Christine's house and kind of working their way out, talking to her friends and all that stuff. Everyone who knew Christine came out to assist in looking for the little girl, including Jill and Nathaniel. 
Now, the search took off, but hours turned into days and then to weeks. Police were unable to find out what happened to little Christine. Now, Nathaniel continued to act strangely, and he began coming home late almost every night. And he would tell Jill that, you know, he he was playing in an extra, what do you call those things? The basketball league after school? Nope, that's me. The basketball <laughs> league after work. <laughs> Intramurals uh, or like a, a free, you know, it's where the older guys like to pretend that they're back in middle yeah. school playing basketball, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So he had joined the basketball Excuse league. Excuse to was drink beer this. with your buddies. Exactly. And so he was doing this about every night and he would come home. Now Jill was getting a little aggravated at him. And he's like, listen, this is my hobby. This is just, this is what I like to do. I'm not out chasing women, right? Uh, I'm just out hanging out with the boys. Sure, Nathaniel. So she she believed him, of course, because there was really no reason not to trust him. Until another early morning knock on the front door. Again, it was the police, and they told the couple that a young woman had filed a complaint that Nathaniel had tried to kidnap her. What? The girl told police that she was at the convenience store. I don't know if it's the same one he robbed, but I would, I would hope not. <laughs> I would, I would hope, hope he was he wouldn't banned. Be allowed there. I would hope, but you never know. The girl told police that she was at the convenience store and Nathaniel offered her a ride and she accepted. You know, it was just kids are lazy. I get it. I don't, yeah, I don't want to walk either. But she says she accepted the ride. But once she got inside the car, he was acting weird. He would not let her out. She was demanding to be let out and he would not do it. So when she finally saw a chance, she did it. She broke out of the car and she ran and she went straight to the police station to tell him the story. So Nathaniel tells officers that, no, I did not do that. I had nothing to do with that. I simply offered that poor girl a ride because it was late and it's chilly out. You know, I was, I was trying to be a nice guy. I'm trying to help her out here. Hmm. Yeah. This is important later. Put that little feather in your cap because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. We're going to circle around, people. We're going to circle we're around. We're going to put a pin in that and then we're going to circle back. Police are not really buying this, of course, and they ask him to come down to the station. Jill, at this point, you know, she's starting to maybe question the love of her life and what's going on here. I mean, you know, if there's once a coincidence and then maybe twice, but, you know, when things start, you just start thinking, maybe I'm, maybe I have my love blinders on, you know, maybe I'm not seeing this right, right? Yeah. So Nathaniel gets a deal. He gets a plea bargain. So he pleads guilty to a misdemeanor and he serves not even a year in jail and a year probation, I believe. So, again, sweet little Jill, she's there waiting for him, right? She's there waiting for him the minute he gets out of jail. But strangely enough, some women nearby start going missing. Yeah, I know you're thinking, Nathaniel sounds like a peach. (laughs) That's one way to put it. So Jill had a good neighbor who had, in fact, become a good friend. Her name was Lorette, and she was just a friendly sort of person who was always smiling And, you know, she always had the time of her life. She was living each day just like it was her last. It was great, right? And Jill loved that. So Jill and Lorette ended up growing quite close. So one afternoon, Lorette comes over and she's got some news for Jill. And, you know, it's it's kind of some big news. And, you know, uh, Jill's like, okay, what is it? She is going to move, but she's not just moving, you know, across town. She's actually moving to the West Indies. Very cool, right? Very cool. She wants the sunshine. She wants to make a fresh start of everything. Now, Jill was sad, but totally understood. And she was actually very happy for her friend, Lorette. Now, Lorette's children and Jill's kids are about the same age. So they'd often play together inside and outside, you know. So it was just, it was kind of sad for Jill that she's going to be missing her friend and that her daughters are also going to, you know, miss their friends. So as Lorette's in there, she says, hey, do you guys happen to have any empty boxes I can borrow for the move? Well, not only... Did they have empty boxes? Nathaniel volunteered to come over and help Lorette move, you know, the heavy items. Lorette graciously accepted the help and told Jill that she would be sure to swing by before leaving to say goodbye and that, you know, she'd bring her kids over to say goodbye to Jill's children as well. A week passes and Jill starts to think, you know, it's kind of strange that I haven't yet heard from Lorette because I'm pretty sure the date that she was planning to leave has now come and gone. Jill's worst worries are confirmed as she opened the morning newspaper and saw splashed across the front page was the headline announcing Lorette had been murdered in her apartment. Well, I guess Nathaniel did something more than lift up the heavy things, correct? Jill was distraught and hysterical, but she was adamant that she wanted to go help out with the service and do what she could to help the grief-stricken family with the little kids as well as, you know, Lorette's family. 
So strangely, Nathaniel jumped all over Jill saying that they can't go attend the service. They can't go attend her funeral because I have a record, you know, and surely police are going to be all over looking for suspicious things at that funeral. Okay. Maybe he... like for the killer, right? Okay. Huge, huge flag there. Let's call the game. Come on. Come on, <laughs> Jill. Let's over. call it. It's over. So uh... Jill's devastated. And she finally agreed that I guess maybe you're right. Maybe we shouldn't go to the funeral of my very good friend. Oh, Jill. Uh, because the police will be there and they're, they need to focus on finding the real killer. And we don't want them focusing their attentions on you and your record, Nathaniel. What about me? It isn't right? fair. So it's just days later that Jill had sat down to watch the evening news when the shock of all shocks hits her. The news announced that there seemed to be a serial killer on the loose. Several women and girls were missing, and even worse, a few of them had been found dead. Their bodies had been found. Jill was frightened, but Nathaniel promised her that he was there. He was going to watch over and protect them. Nothing is going to happen to Jill and the girls. Thank goodness, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Thank like, God hey, for I... Nathaniel. Hmm. At this time, Nathaniel was still playing his late night ball games and just had, sure as he'd he been doing in the past. But one night he came home and Jill noticed something. She's shocked. On Nathaniel's arm was a bloody claw mark, almost as if somebody had scratched his arm. It was really deep, almost like needing stitches. Well, Nathaniel blamed his teammates because, you know, they were trying to get the ball away from him and they played really rough. Hmm. Right. Did Jill, it hurt their manicures? Guess so. Yeah. Jill, unfortunately, bought that excuse. She had no problem with Nathaniel staying out on the nights. She didn't have to work because most nights when she did work, she had to, you know, would work night shift and Nathaniel would stay home with the girls while she was at work. That was until... Poor thing. Love is blind. It just blinds you, doesn't it? Sure does, man. Blind, deaf, and dumb. All that worked out until one night. Something happened. Something very strange happened. As Jill was trying to leave for work, her girls were crying and begging her not to go to work that night. Now, Jill explained to them, you know, I have to go to work. I understand that you're upset. Mommy has to go to work. Mommy has to make the bills, all that good stuff. Well, they were so inconsolable. Jill was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to call in sick tonight, but that's it. You girls have to understand. I can't keep doing this. I can't do this. All right. Mm -hmm. So in the future, you have to knock it off. When mommy goes to work, mommy has to go to work. Well, the girls quieted down. And they all went to bed. All was calm for a bit until one afternoon. Jill was waiting for the girls to get home from school. And when they failed to ride the bus and get off at their normal bus stop, as they were supposed to do, Jill called the school and got yet another shock. The principal informed her that her daughters had come to school that day. And one of them in particular went to a teacher and had confessed to that teacher that Nathaniel had been touching her in the nighttime. The children were put into protective custody, and Jill would need to follow up with them to get more information. Oh, my God. Ooh, he'd never make it out of the door. I'd kill him. He wouldn't. Mm-hmm. No. Have a little, little gun waiting for him when he, when he got home. <sighs> so Jill gets off the phone. And she's immediately, I mean, screaming at Nathaniel. She is freaking out. Like, how could you? Are you kidding me? Blah, 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 blah. Nathaniel, as he always does assures her that this has to be a mistake. And you know what? Let's get in the car right now. We're going to run down to that school. We're going to give them a piece of our mind. We're going to figure this all out and we're coming home with the girls. So Jill and Nathaniel climb in the car. They barely make it out the driveway when all of a sudden several police cars swarm in and cover them with guns drawn, yelling at them to not move. Jill is speechless. She's looking around. She's wanting answers. Like what in the world is going on? I don't clueless of course is this a joke i mean the principal just said my kids aren't coming home and then now we're what is going on right two detectives open the car doors they handcuff jill and nathan and they take them in the two are separated and within 24 hours nathaniel white confirms all of their suspicions nathaniel white was the man responsible for all the missing women that jill saw on tv that day Nathaniel White ended up confessing to killing six people in the Middleton, New York area during this time. Uh, well, he was supposed to be out with his buddies, correct? Um, you would uh, guess that at that time, right? Yeah. During, during what he was supposed to be doing. Before you said the cops were coming, I would have thought that the school would have called the police first. I would think so, too. And then the police would have shown up. But, but maybe, I yeah. guess since they knew... The police had maybe put it all together and then they got the call and then they knew they had to Mm -hmm. make 
the arrest sooner rather than later. Right. I don't know. Exactly. Just how did police find this man who would confess to murdering six women? Well, the credit goes all to a mama bear along with sister bear. Woohoo! So two of the victims, two weeks after Angela Hopkins, age 23, and her cousin Brenda Whiteside were last seen on July 20th at a bar called The Blue Note. Angela Hopkins' mother and sister went to that bar later on to talk to the locals and see if they could recall anything about the two missing girls that night. Now, when they first arrived there, there wasn't all for nothing. You see, the daughter had went to the bar with them that evening when some gentleman approached the ladies and said, hey, do you guys want to go party somewhere else? Well, Cecilia, the sister, said, no, I have stuff to do tomorrow. I can't go. So she actually saw the men that Brenda and Angela disappeared with. Okay, didn't have a name, sort of had a a look about them or whatever. So two weeks later, when they go into the bar, they're asking locals, hey, do you know who this guy was? Do you have him? You know, do you does he come here a lot? Well, it didn't take too long before they gave them a name, Nathaniel White. Well, heck, yeah. So with that with that name, the new detective dynamic duo went to police and gave them the name that they had just received from one of the regulars at the bar. By the next morning, the state police had went in and pulled Mr. White in for questioning. He soon confessed to the killings within 48 hours of the Hopkins family encounter with the bar, people telling them who this fellow was, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't two days later, Mr. White was out, and this is a little chilling. He uh, agreed to go with police to help locate bodies he had um, dumped, I guess, got rid of, but he needed pizza too. So he's eating pizza, telling them, you know, out in the woods where to find corpses, where to find dead bodies, right? Are you there? No, yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I just, I looked him He's up. He's eating pizza. <laughs> no, He's eating I pizza. Nathaniel White would be charged with six counts of murder and would be found guilty on all counts. An interesting note to add here is, well, and it's a little bit controversial, is remember earlier when he was accused of and waiting trial for the abduction of that girl earlier, mm-hmm. right? And he plea bargained down to make it a misdemeanor, so he got out early. He actually committed his first murder then. And then after getting out of the short, short little plea bargain sentence he got, he would commit his second murder. Okay. Now, Nathaniel White would claim that he was following orders from the voices he heard in his head. Mm. And he started his reign of terror in March of 1991 after he saw the futuristic horror movie Robocop. Dun, dun, dun. So a quote by Mr. Nathaniel White regarding the RoboCop. He said, the first girl I killed was from a RoboCop move. I seen him cut somebody's throat and then take the knife and slit down the chest to the stomach and left the body in a certain position. With the first person I killed, I did exactly what I saw in the movie. He also claimed that he committed the murders because voices told him to, as I stated earlier. Now, he would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. However, thank goodness, he was found guilty on six counts of second-degree murder, and he was uh, sentenced to 150 years to life. Sadly, Jill would learn through all of this that one of the women that Nathaniel had murdered was, in fact, her good friend, Lorette, and she had been murdered shortly after Nathaniel so graciously agreed to help her move, right? But that wasn't the worst part. Besides killing your best friend, sexually molesting your niece, and your own daughters? There's something worse? There sure is. I'm glad. Boy, that's not a perfect setup, Jen. Thank you. As Jill and her Thanks. family <laughs> were sitting around trying to comprehend all this, I mean, in shock, crying, tears, I can't believe it. The phone rings. And this would be the biggest shock of all. On the other end was the detective. And he informed them that one of Nathaniel's victims was, in fact, Jill's niece, Jill's older brother, <gasps> 14-year-old daughter, Christine, who went missing months ago. Christine, it would turn out, would be his youngest victim. Poor Told you baby. it gets worse. Told you. So his victims. Well, he had to get rid of her in his own sick way. Because Months she, later. But right? But still, yeah. So just a little to, I guess, not forget them or whatever I was going to, because I didn't do them by name. So Julianne Frank was 29 and she was of Middletown, 
Um, she was actually pregnant with her third child when she was found stabbed to death. Her body was located March 22nd, 1991. Angela Hopkins, that's the one whose mom helped get his name to police, was 23 years old of Poughkeepsie and was the mother of two small children. Her body was found August 4th, 1992. She had been bludgeoned to death. Lorette Riviere Huggins, 34, was of Middletown, and she was the mother of three children. She worked um, in insurance, and her body was found stabbed and strangled in July 10th, 1992, in her home. Adrian Hunter, 27, of Middleton, had two children. The youngest was only four months old. Her body Mm -hmm. was found stabbed to death July 30th, 1992. Christine Klebe, 14, that's the niece, had just completed eighth grade at Circleville Middle School in June 1992. Her body was found August 4th, 1992. She was, as I said, Jill's niece, Jill's brother's daughter. And lastly, Brenda Whiteside, 20, of Elmsford. And her body was found bludgeoned to death on August 4th, 1992. Nathaniel White is currently, thank goodness, still in the penitentiary serving his sentence of 150 plus years. Wow. Did they say what, how they finally got to know that he was the serial killer? Like what actually happened to catch him? Well, the mom and the daughter went and found his name, that part. But then also he said he just was hearing voices. He was doing what the voices wanted, but he had claimed somewhere along where I read that he was, um, he had said he had maybe been abused to and things like that, but that wasn't true. The little Christine, her dad, Jill's brother, would say that he was a pervert from the get-go. He would always had a weird fascination with women, and he would constantly talk about wanting to do perverted things to them, with them, in front of his girlfriend's brother. Hello? Really? Ugh. So he, That's disgusting. Yeah, he was just a creep. So I don't, you know, if you ever thought you wanted to get out there and date ladies, there you go. Don't do it. I'm telling you. <laughs> Creepy. Creepy. So scary. I just can't believe, like, I say this like we don't go over this every single time, and I act like it's something new, and we've been doing this two and a half years, but I always just think, like, why would you kill Christine? What, that is basically your girlfriend, whom you say you love. It's her niece. You know, it's her brother's kid. How heartbreaking is that? And just, I based a lot of this off a show called Your Worst Nightmare, I believe. Uh Just to, to be, like, this poor Jill... And I didn't want to give her a last name because I don't like doing stuff like that. But she was just crying hysterically. And she's like, this is all my fault. I brought this guy into our lives. I caused all of this. My friend, my niece, and then all these other girls, too, you know? So That's so sad because it wasn't her fault. No, I mean... I mean, she shouldn't blame herself. But, you know... I mean, I get the guilt, but hopefully she's found... Well, and people saying Some peace with the fact. Same thing that we always say, right? How could you not see that? How could you not know? And people saying that. But once I think once you're in that, I think it is hard because you the human mind is not programmed to think like that. Well, except for me. And I always think that about people. But do you see what I'm saying? Like traditionally, you don't think that you just don't. You can't. That's not normal. When you love someone, you tend to look away at first Mm -hmm. and not realize. And 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 then when you've been married for a while, you really do know all those faults and they annoy you. But in the beginning... No, I totally get it. Yeah. You don't look at the red flags, even though they're being thrown left and right. You don't pick up on them. Because, because it's not normal. You, That's not normal. You have your blinders on. Right. Who, who would go kill a baby, a 14-year-old? She's 14. She just graduated middle school. Crime any sex. Who finds them sexually attractive? I, who finds young kids sexually attractive? You know, I, I don't know. So that is the story of Nathaniel White. Good one. Insane. And so. Crazy story. Yeah. There you have it, Jen. So, Jen, Jen, right. you got any promos? I do. Tonight's or two days or this week's promo is by our good friend, Julia. Julia is the host of Always Time for True Crime. Go out, look for her. I think she's on any major podcatchers and go check her out. Yay, Julia, because you know what? There is always time for true crime. Let's be honest. There is always time for true crime. Yes, there is. All right, Jen, you got anything? This is kind of a shorter episode. You want to chit-chat for a second? You got anything going on? Anything new? Watching anything good mm-hmm. on TV? I watched Run on Netflix. Run, baby, run, That baby, is with run, baby. Sarah Paulson from American Horror Story. Oh. 
fame. I really enjoyed it. I kind of get what the plot was at. I guess the plot quickly. But there is a really good twist that was like, damn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I enjoyed it. It was good. It kept my attention. And for those of you that don't know, I have a very short attention span. It's true. So I wasn't playing on my phone within 15 minutes of watching the film. So yeah, I got you. I watched The Undoing on HBO. That was pretty good. And I kind of guessed it too, but that's okay. I still liked it. I just watched last night because they released it early on HBO. The new Euphoria sort of oh, a standalone yeah. episode. I just love Zendaya. She is the cutest she's thing. The, I swear to goodness. Adorable. And she's, what a good actress. Seriously, it's good. So check it out. Um, she's what a else? She's a beautiful girl. Yeah, Flawless really skin. Teeny tiny. Yeah, like me. That's what they say about me, Jen. They do. That, Camille. I've, I've heard it. Tiny, flawless skin. <laughs> yep. yep. That's what they say. It's a curse. What can I say? It's just... And I did finish The Queen's Gambit a while back. Mm-hmm. And that, I loved it. I loved it. I didn't think, I wasn't for sure if all the hype was going to be that yeah, great for a chess show. Yeah. But it wasn't really about chess. And Mm-mm. so it was. Her character was from... amazing. Yeah. Loved it. Oh, the clothes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they were nice. Huh? I love that mid-century look and feel and the clothes and the. Did you watch The Crown uh, Furniture, yet? just everything. Which one? The Crown? Yeah, did you watch that yet? I'm late to the game. I just finished the first season. Oh, But um, I can't wait to get up to... I know, I haven't watched it. And I can't wait to get up to the one with Diana and okay. Charles and I'm all that I'm interested kind of to things. see what you think because uh, one of my friends is a diehard Crown devotee. And mm-hmm. I watched this season and I liked it because we kind of grew up with this. So I kind of felt like I kind of knew what was going on a little bit more. Right. Right. My good friend hated it, hated it. So I'm interested if anybody has any opinions, put it on our discussion page. I'm just interested to see because I liked it. I'm looking forward to it because I was the girl that woke up. I was 10 at the time and I woke up to watch the wedding at 4 a.m. Yep. You and so. Dawn, I remember. Yep, Rhonda. Yep, I loved it. Loved it. It was. I was so smitten. My mom and her friend actually sent Charles and Di a wedding present. Yeah, like they ever they saw that. The goodwill over in London got that. <laughs> they got a thank you for. I'm it. sure they did. <laughs> they did, yeah. and it was kind of as a joke. They sent the because they're like, "What would we give a prince and princess?" Right, and they're like, "Oh, let's do something silly." So they sent them a Tupperware lettuce crisper. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And because they actually you know got... that's what they would be doing that in the kitchen. <laughs> Diana, Diana, sure do we have was... the crisper? We, we, listen, we don't, I'm sure nobody it likes all... we'll take lettuce. We need that Tupperware crisper. Right? It was, I'm sure they donated it. That's what um, I said, the goodwill But over there. they actually, the thank you card was personalized. It was mm-hmm. like, thank you so much for the Tupperware lettuce crisper. We appreciate the, je- you know, it, it was... Kind of amazing. Yep. My mom still has it somewhere. The third in line of the assistants wrote all those, I'm sure. Oh, no. I'm sure they had no clue what it was. I'm but, just kidding. Or that they even knew that my parents sent it yeah. or my mom sent it. But just the fact that they received unofficial letterhead yeah. and it's nice and thick and it was... I told her she should have it framed because I think it's kind of fun. It's funny. Yeah, totally. You I know? can't imagine it's funny. the letter coming in the mail and you're like, oh. What is this? Yeah, right? it's got the funny. royal seal on mm-hmm. it. It's got everything. I mean, my dad hung all his letters from Jed Hoover up. I would. Like all of his documents saying, Thomas J, last name, has now been awarded a 2% raise, so he now makes $6,000 a year wow. or such and such. Well, you know what I mean? one place there, Tommy. <laughs> well, back in 60. Different time. I know, I know, I know. I know. 60, 1960. Yeah. It was kind of a big deal. But yeah, I would totally frame that sucker up and stick it on my wall. I would. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But no, I can't wait to watch The Crown. Okay. Those, the last season. What else have you been watching? The Murder on Madison Hill. Is that what it's called on HBO? Today is the finale. I can't wait to watch it. But sadly. Because- Middle- Madison Beach yeah, or Middle Madison Hill or something? Beast. Yes. Yes. That one. That yeah. one. Cutie Pie Middle Madison. The- it's Middle Beach, isn't it? Not Madison. Madison's the guy's yes, name. Yes. Then that's why I think he's cute. <laughs> and so that's what- <laughs> To me, that's So that's what all I call that's it. in your head. Yes, exactly. I have name problems, but you, so do you. Well, I just, you know, whatever. But uh, I went ahead and Googled stuff on it. So I'm kind of sad because, well, I'm just kind of sad. That's all I'm going to say about that. But of course, I'll be watching well, that this Well, it's unsolved, evening. right? Yes, it's unsolved. See, I wasn't even going to so say it can that. Only... I wasn't going to well, say the, that. The whole Try thing not to is. Give stuff away. 
but everybody Spoiler. knows it's unsolved because that's how it was promoted at HBO. Yeah, but I in my head I was like, I want to know. You know, I hate not knowing. You know, I hate well, that. I mean, well, I'm sure Madison hates not knowing what happened to his mother either, I'm, or either whatever word is either, used tomato, in that situation. Tomato. But yeah, so now I can binge it. So the last one's on tonight. I can binge Correct. it. I can't. I have a hard time doing serial things. I have to have it all at once to binge Isn't it. that funny? And that is such a new concept for us because back in the day, remember appointment TV? That's what they called NBC with the Friends and the Seinfeld. Everybody would make an appointment to be home on Thursday nights to watch uh, mm -hmm. the Thursday night lineup because if you missed it, you couldn't see you it again. You had to wait until the summer. Until the rerun. Until the summer. Yeah. Yep. And they didn't have reruns until the summer. Yep. They either have it had it through um, the little hiatus that they took in March, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. Right? And then, or summertime. I know. That's my point, Jen. And now that we've grown up, we're spoiled. So you binge a whole season say, of something in a weekend or whatever. There's only, let's see, four more sleeps, I think. Uh, well, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Tuesday Friday, night. Saturday, Sunday. Three more sleeps. Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Nope, four more sleeps. We got it. There's four more sleeps till the nightmare of Christmas You're starts. You're such a mathlete. I love you. I know. I, I did that without a calculator. Okay, three times. You got it right. Three Third times. Time. You did. <laughs> I know. I'm so proud. It's a charm. Three is the magic number. Uh, That's what they always said on Sesame Street. It's true. All right, Jen, until All then, right. remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at artruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all Our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. You know, when you first say, when you first said he showers you, I thought you were just going to say he showers. And I'm like, oh, my God, what a heavenly godsend that would be. <laughs> well, these days in 20, 2020, <laughs> you just, I'm just saying you, you never know. Yeah. Right. It's uh, yeah. 2020. There, our list of demands get shorter. Exactly. Oh, well, the older we get to. Our yes. List yes. Gets, true. Breathing so is love. pretty much just up at the top. <laughs> Yeah, that's a little negotiable, too, these days. I seen him. Well, obviously, he's never seen inside of a book because it would be, I saw him. <laughs> oh, Lord. Robocop. Dun, dun, dun. The movie made me ill, physically ill. I, I think I don't know if it's just it. because we, oh, I don't know if it was because we sat too close to the screen and it just made me sick to my stomach or if it was just because it was so violent and i was young mm -hmm. you know fairly young i should say so i don't know I every time you. i remember it i just remember feeling a queasy stomach mm -hmm. i will say this uh yesterday the depressing news of david l lander um squiggy or landers squiggy passed away that kind of broke my heart i've always loved lenny and squiggy yeah my favorite hollywood couple ever um they were, if you don't know, they were on Laverne and Shirley. They were the neighbors that would come down with the hello, just walk into their apartment. Yeah. And I was watching videos. They did a, they used to pretend that they were a rock and roll group called Lenny and the Squig Tones. <laughs> and they sang all these songs and they were fantastic. And they even, which I did not know and I wish I did, but in 1979, they went on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Did you Google it? Did you YouTube it and find it? I YouTubed it. Yeah. No, it, somebody had posted or had uh, posted, posted a link 
to one of their songs that they did. Mm. And then I started scrolling down and it said, you know, the American bandstand, Lenny and, Squid, Lenny and the Squig Tones. It's just fun. It's very it's nostalgic fun. for me. That was the Vernon Shirley was one of the TV shows that I absolutely positively had. It was to our must see TV on Tuesday nights. Happy day, seven to seven thirty. Tuesday night, seven thirty to eight would be Laverne and Shirley. Lynn, mm-hmm. And Laverne yep. and Shirley was my absolute favorite. And for those of you listening elsewhere, we are in Central Standard Time, so we're off by an hour to the East Coast and the Colorado Rockies and California. And do not, I do not know why. Never have known that. Yeah. So yeah, that's but, why. Anyway. But yeah, it broke my heart. He uh They're all it's because of our age. Funny Jen, guy. just falling to the sides. I'm telling you, I don't like well, it. Well he had complications with his MS. I know, but I just so don't, I don't like it. I don't like getting old. Anyway, it just made me sad because I liked him. And if you have a chance to Google Lenny and the Squig Tones, there is one kind of funny Christmas song they did since we're in the holiday of Christmas right now. Um so it just made me laugh, made me giggle. But anyway, that's enough of a downer. So, Thanks, Jen. Wait. Godspeed, David Landers, my little squiggy. Hey, guys. I'm Julia, the host of Always Time for True Crime. Each week, I cover a lesser-known case of murder, both solved and unsolved, disappearances, or serial killers. So if you're looking for something beyond Ted Bundy or John JonBenet Ramsey, Come check out Always Time for True Crime and learn about some cases you may have never heard of. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts.